super excited about how different this Christmas season will be. If you were with us last year, we did the Christmas or the Advent Conspiracy. We're going to start that in two weeks. So get ready, warm your hearts, and uh, invite somebody as we begin that special series. So I want to begin uh, this morning following that by saying uh, Happy Veterans Day. So how many veterans do we have? I know we have a couple. So thank you, Tom, Marcy. And uh, was that it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Josh in the back there. Um, if you know a vet, uh, yesterday was officially Veterans Day and we, we, I mean today, sorry, today is Veterans Day and hopefully some of you get off tomorrow <laughs> to celebrate it tomorrow. I saw some of your faces that are not getting off tomorrow, but at any rate, uh, thank a veteran today if you can to show that I know that Sunday is actually Veterans Day. Now, I didn't serve, but a few years ago I had the opportunity to attend a graduation of a soldier, dear friend of mine, kid who was in our youth group at uh, the Marine graduation at Paris Island, South Carolina. And it was an incredibly humbling experience. Since then, I've had the opportunity to marry a number of, uh, of, of officers and those who are actively serving. A couple weeks ago, I did a wedding for uh, an, an officer and all the, the men, the five men in, in his wedding party were all dressed in their dress blues, current officers. There were about 40 uh, currently serving officers at that wedding. It was so humbling. Listen to this. The mission of Paris Island is this. We make Marines by recruiting quality young men and women and transforming them through the foundations of rigorous basic training, our, our shared legacy, and a commitment to our values, preparing them to win our nation's battles in service to the country. Paris Island is a 12-week rigorous training program that culminates with what they call the Crucible. Here's the way the Crucible is described on the Marine website. The final challenge of the 12-week boot camp is known as the Crucible. It is a 54-hour training exercise that validates the physical, mental, and moral training they've endured throughout the recruit training. The recruits are broken down into squads to face the challenges of the Crucible. They face challenges testing their physical strength, skills, and the Marine Corps values they've learned throughout the training. Throughout the event, the recruits are only allowed a limited amount of food and sleep over 54 hours. The final stage of the crucible is a nine mile hike from the training grounds to the Iwo Jima flag raising statue at Petros parade deck. Upon completing this challenge, the recruits are handed their eagle globe and anchors, sorry, symbolizing the completion of their arduous journey to become US Marines. And I'm emotional because I was there just a few days after, and I just, I just am flooded with memories, remembering what it was like hearing the stories of those who went through that. My friend literally went through the, my friend who went through the crucible literally had to be dragged the last few miles to the end. And he was, and he made it. He went through the incredible adversity that they call the crucible. The Marine Corps itself uh, describes the fact that they, they're unashamed in saying they inflict that adversity or they inflicted that adversity upon him. Why would people do such a thing? Well, because they're preparing those men and women for war. That's why. And they know if there's no adversity, there will be no growth. And they know the right kind of adversity, at least for the most part, to bring about that growth. C.S. Lewis said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for extraordinary destiny. And the Apostle Paul, he likened the Christian life to that of a soldier when he said to Timothy, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.3. Now we don't like or seek adversity or suffering and if you do, I think you're a little weird. <laughs> we don't seek it. I think that would not necessarily be a good thing, but they are built into our lives, aren't they? In fact, the greatest adversity is really a war that rages within us. It's the war between our flesh, the weakest fallen part of our lives, and then the Spirit of God. And even for someone who's not yet a Christian, who doesn't have the Spirit of God in them, it is the same war that wages within them against the Spirit of God for our souls. 
Like Marines who complete their training at Paris Island through the crucible, we grow as Christians and as people, as human beings, through the crucible of adversity, don't we? That stinks, though, man. That stinks. Oh, I wish it was another way. I mean, I, can't we just read books and watch movies and learn everything that we need to know? Now, thankfully, God knows exactly what we need, and he gave us the letter of Galatians here that we've been going through as somewhat of a how-to manual, if you will, how to grow in gospel character in, in the Christian life, in and through adversity. So let's listen to what he says. I think it'll be very applicable and very relevant for all of us. And by his grace, may we be truly set free, set free to take significant steps of growth in our character as followers of Jesus this week, or steps toward him if we are not. First, let's look at this fact that the struggle is real. We grow in gospel character, not in peacetime, but in wartime. And like I said, like Paul is saying here, it's a war that's within. So here's the way he begins. We're picking up in verse 16, Galatians chapter 5. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are at war with one another. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do whatever you want. Verse 18, but if, or since, you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So Paul begins by saying there's no way that you can possibly lose the war within if you're walking with the Spirit. A person who is walking and filled with and keeping in step with the Spirit of God cannot sin. I shouldn't say cannot. Doesn't sin. When you're walking with God in the Spirit, you don't sin. But I sin all the time. <laughs> I sin all the time. And so it, there's got to be a disconnect. There's a war that I'm often losing. Really, I think it would be better to say we win the war when we're done with this flesh. And one day we will be done with this flesh and we'll have a new body that cannot sin. While we're in this body, we lose a lot of the battles, but we ultimately will win the war. Make sense? This is really the main theme here. And from here on in this book, Paul's going to talk about how do we walk in the Spirit as a way of life in the Spirit. Because for the Christian, when we talk about the way of life being these things or whatever, we could boil it down. The Christian life, the Christian way of life is walking in the Spirit of God. This is what separates Christians from any other faith or religion. You know, if you're... And by the way, this is not to belittle any religion or whatever, but if you're Buddhist, Buddha is not walking with you, nor do they claim to. If you're, if you're a Muslim, you, you, Muhammad is not, the spirit of Muhammad does not dwell in you. If you're Hindu, there, there's no God that is indwelling in you, who's walking in you, empowering you to do it. But as a Christian, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us. But the struggle is very real, is it not, friends? The problem of the flesh... The flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. But it's the war that sets the context for us to grow. I wish it wasn't so. <laughs> so uh, anybody um, get in great shape at one point in your life? For some of us, it was a long time ago. For some others of us, it was closer. But anyone get in great shape without pain? Like that's, you, the, you ever watch like these infomercials, these commercials where it's this device and like, just do this three minutes a day and you're going to look like me. And it's like, you know, Hulk Hogan, you know, or not Hulk Hogan, but Hulk, I just said Hulk Hogan. I, does anyone know who that is? Um, you know, just some like bodybuilder, just push this thing like this for three minutes. Just step on this. No sweat needed. And you'll be look like, you know, whatever. No, there's always pain. I mean, have you ever accomplished anything in life that wasn't accomplished through 
some sacrifice and pain. Like, think about your education or your career accomplishments, things that you've, you've done all, all by the grace of God. It's usually through some adversity that got you to that point. Unless something was just given to you, but to really accomplish something. Now, football season's only one more week, okay? For my kids. So that's going to come to an end. Maybe another couple weeks, you'll hear something, and then it's over. And next Saturday, both of my sons are playing in their Super Bowl, which is awesome. And they've been working. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, it's, it's great. They, they've been, you know, working really, really hard. And mom and dad have been driving really, really hard. And, you know, in sports, just in general, like it, we're talking about in life, but in sports, like you're sacrificing so much to win. And it, it's through the struggle. Talking to one, a close friend of mine, he spoke at Elijah's 13th birthday, been a, been a kind of a mentor of his and is now mentoring Ephraim as a middle linebacker. And, um, and he said, you know, you win or you learn. Like when you lose... Or when you fail at something at life, when you give in to temptation, when you, even when you give in to sin, you either, you either win that battle or you learn from it. You grow through it. It's so wise. It's such a wise statement. I, from now on, I, I, mean, I kind of say it like a, as if I own that statement now. I mean, I used to think, I still think, you know, if you just repeat something that you heard three times, it's yours. I still give Andy credit for it, though. You either win or you learn. When you lose, you learn. If you learn through losing, you're going to win eventually, or at least you're going to grow. You're going to learn. Now, we don't seek pain. It's just part of the war that already rages within us. You don't even have to seek it out. It's raging in you right now. It's through the pain of the war that we're able to grow the character of Jesus, though. Do you realize that even in the book of Hebrews it says, through his suffering, Jesus learned obedience. Even Jesus, who he didn't have to learn from losing, he always was perfect and without sin, but through his suffering, think of the image, the picture of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In agony, he's bleeding sweat, or he's sweating blood. <laughs> bleeding. He's bleeding sweat, that's a little weird. That would be weird. <laughs> Even sweating blood is a little weird, but he's sweating blood in agony. Not my will, God, not my will. Through the suffering of these moments, recognizing that he's about to do it and he's been preparing to do it, to go to the cross and suffer. And it was through that whole experience, the writer of Hebrews says, he somehow learned obedience in that. So if that's... The one whom we're following, it just makes sense that there's going to be some suffering, and Paul says, suffer as a good soldier, because that's how it works. He says here, it's the desires of the flesh. Now, this is so important, because I want you to understand the war that's raging within you. When he says desires of the flesh, it's literally an over-desire. It's an over-desire. It's an all-controlling desire. It's often... Well, this is the core enemy of the war. It's what rages in our hearts, and it's often something good that we want, but we overwant it. We want it too much. We want it too much, and it controls us. We over-desire good things. Just think about comfort. That's not a bad thing to want to be comfortable, right? It's not a bad thing to want to have a comfortable life in your comfortable home. Oh, but we can over-desire that, can't we? <laughs> I think there are really three core areas. First, money isn't wrong. I think maybe four and just put comfort on there, right? But money is certainly not wrong. We need some money to get by, right? We need some money to pay our bills. It's essential. But the love of money is the root of evil. All kinds of evil. So it's good, but if you, if you over want money, just think about it in your own life. I'm sure, like me, you've gone through seasons in your life where you've been fixated on, I need to get a raise or I just need more money. And then you went through that whole experience and you got more and you're like, oh, that didn't make it all better. And then we can continue to go through that cycle throughout life. You know, and I'm telling you, like I struggle. I, I, 
I don't want to say I'm a poor pastor. Some of y'all are looking at me right now, and I got some new shoes. Man, I got some new shoes. <laughs> so I got to be careful. Like, so you're like, oh, I ain't no poor pastor. You got some nice new leather shoes there. Now, so see, here's, here's, here's my deal. I'm going to give away one of my secrets. See, what I do is I, see, I, I got to dress up when I do weddings. So I got to have some nice clothes. And so what I do is I go on clearance at Joseph A. Bank, and I get me some nice clothes. Real cheap. Love it. And you buy enough, and you get these coupons. So I got this coupon that expired last week, and I had to use it. It was a $50 coupon. So these shoes, these shoes were $100, and they were half off. I got them for $2.50. Right there, $2.50. Oh, I was thinking $250. Oh, no, 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 no. Come on, that's another pastor somewhere. That ain't me. <laughs> yeah, so check out my $2.50. I had to buy something, and I was like, I can't, this is a waste of $50 if I don't buy something. I just couldn't find something that I really needed, and so I kind of could use some, another pair of shoes. So anyway, <laughs> the point being this, like, man, sometimes I think, man, I just a little more, and, and, then, and then we'll be, you know, and then you get a, just a little more. If it's just a little more, then we'll, then we'll be a little more comfortable. And then we'll be able to do the, you know. And it's not all bad, but to over want a little more is then to fall into the flesh. Sex is one of my favorite topics. It's great. It's the pregnant pause. <laughs> pregnant sex. Anyway, it does go together. But it's great in marriage. It will tear your life apart outside of marriage. And many of us have experienced that. Devastate people's lives and families outside of marriage. I, I mean, we don't have to, you just think about your own life, I'm sure. You're, I'm sure every one of us in this room has been affected in one way or another by this wonderful gift of sex that happened outside of marriage, whether it was a parent or someone in your family or you yourself or whatever, your best friend. This, we could go on and on and on and on and on, couldn't we? It's great, man. It's great. In the context of marriage. Authority is a gift of God to our world. You ever been around someone who over wants authority? I mean, I've struggled with overwanting it myself. When authority is not humbly submitted to God, it can then be used to abuse and even exploit others. I just read this wonderful book, and I hope what I would like to do in the next year and even years ahead is I would love to go through, actually I was telling Drew this a couple weeks ago, I would love to go through this book with those of you who are in the marketplace, which is many of you. It's called Strong and Weak. Oh, it's awesome. It's changing my paradigm in how I look at authority and suffering. Because what we, or vulnerability. What we need is a balanced, I think Andy is right, Andy Crouch wrote the book. I think he's right in that all people need a certain amount of authority, not a position of authority. But all people have a certain amount of authority they need and vulnerability. And when we have the right authority and vulnerability, we can lead well. I'm not talking about a position of leadership. So think about the greatest leaders that you know. You probably would describe them as people who were vulnerable appropriately, right? The greatest leaders in our lives aren't, you know, powerful dictators. They may have done, quote, you know, great things in terms of, you know, even for evil. But I think of some of the great mentors of my life, the leaders that I like to read about. They were strong. They stewarded their leadership well, humbly, but they were appropriately vulnerable and they recognized how vulnerable they were. Because at the end of the day, Steve Jobs put his pants on one leg at a time. He, he actually, he, he put socks on probably and had to take showers. I mean, he's a human. He's just a man. Some of my, you know, my sports mentors, not mentors, uh, my, you know, the people that I, I wish I could meet that person. Like they wake up and they breathe air and they have to eat and put on clothes and they're just people, right? So the greatest leaders recognize the place of authority and vulnerability and, and, and in that place, what Andy says is the place of flourishing. And all God's desire for all human beings is to experience flourishing. That's what this church is all about. 
restoration. When someone is restored to God, restored to community, restored to mission, then they're able to begin the process of flourishing. And don't I, I, long, I long for that for us, but I long that we are all people who our impact in our community, our impact in our workplace results in other people flourishing. Just think of especially those who are vulnerable and suffering. And just imagine what will happen if and, and when we hear stories of, of, of people who are even be, at one point in time were being exploited and they're, and they're unleashed and empowered and flourish. It's just amazing. And that's what God does. Well, gosh, just I'm, I, we got to move in back into the sermon. But uh, story after story after story. What, what did Jesus do when he touched people? Who did he go to? He went to the most vulnerable people. And what did he do when he engaged those people? Think about the woman caught in adultery. Just, she was ready to die. She was moments from being stoned to death because of what she got caught doing in that day. And Jesus stepped in, and what did he do? He said to the, those perpetrators, okay, whoever's not guilty, uh, go ahead and throw the first stone. They all walked away, and he says, hey, you're, go flourish. Wow. Our communities need that. Desperately. Okay, so the desires of the flesh are often these over desires, and they're warring within us. The struggle is real. I love what pastor and author David Pallison says about this. He says this quote, If idolatry is the characteristic and summary Old Testament word for our drift from God, then desires is the characteristic and summary New Testament word for the same drift. The New Testament merges the concept of idolatry and the concept of inordinate life-ruling desires for lust, craving, yearning, and greedy demand. Ephesians 5, Colossians 3 are great resources, or great uh, uh, text for that. So the struggle is real. And the old way of doing things is not powerful enough to win the war within us. The old way is not going to work. He says in verse 18, but if or since you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. He didn't say, notice what Paul didn't say here. He didn't say, since you were led by the Spirit, you're not under the what? What are we talking about here? War between what? The flesh and the Spirit. So he says, he says, he didn't say, since you were led by the Spirit, you're no longer under the flesh. He says, you are no longer under the law. Paul's point was that we can never overcome the war within us by keeping the law. We can never get out. We can never be set free by doing anything, in fact. Isn't this good news? Your neighbor, yourself, your neighbor, your coworker, the people that you know in your life cannot be set free from what they are currently enslaved to by doing anything. But other than being set free by the grace of God. I mean, this message is berserk. It's just crazy good news. Now, look at, at we got to drill down so that we understand the nature of what we're talking about. It's important that we understand the nature of what we're talking about so that we really recognize that there isn't anything we can do to unearth this. So look, he talks about, I, I'm just calling this the personality of the flesh. This is what the flesh produces. There are four destructive attitudes. He says the acts of the flesh are obvious. <laughs> And just as we read through this, it's obvious why they're obvious. So three have to do with sexuality. Sexual immor immorality, which is sex between unmarried people. Impurity, which is unnatural sexual practices and relationships. And debauchery, which is uncontrolled sexuality. Now, those things can be secret, but they're fairly obvious. If you're observing, they're fairly obvious, right? Two have to do with religion. And here, they're, they have to do with occult pagan practices. So he says, idolatry, which is making substitutes for God. And then witchcraft, which is faking the work of God. Or real work of Satan. So the involvement of witchcraft. And then notice, eight words describe how the flesh destroys relationships. And no explanation is needed. Hatred discord, jealousy, fits of rage, 
selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Friends, in the church, I mean, notice which list is long, longest here. I mean, which to-dos and which to-don'ts like, could we major on if we were going to major on do's and don'ts, right? There's nothing... That there, there's nothing more attractive on one hand than a unified church is filled with true love and grace that gets extended to us when we really choose the flesh. Because sometimes we just choose the flesh we're, we're, we're between each other. Like we're talking to each other. We get upset. We, we, we have a fit of rage or anger or envy or jealousy or something like that. And we choose that instead of the spirit. We do it all the time, essentially. And, 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 and instead of saying, I don't want anything to do with that. We say, hey, man, I love, I love you because God loves me. <laughs> and if God can love me and, and restore me, then he can do that with you too. And so I'm just going to be extra patient. And there's a power that allows us to do that that we're going to look at in just a minute. So those are the things that describe what tears relationship, relationships apart. And then two words describe substance abuse, drunkenness and orgies and the like, he said. He's not talking about a sexual orgy. He's talking about a drinking orgy. And just think like a binge drinking party, which uh, maybe you've heard of those in college or sometime or whatever. But you probably know what that is like, right? Now, for those who live like this, Paul gives a very strong warning. He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. He is not saying, Christian, if you fall into this, you're going to lose your salvation. He's clearly, he's not talking about that. Paul simply stated what the family of the world does in contrast to what the family of God does. Here's what the family of the world is characterized by, and that those people who practice these things don't inherit the kingdom of God. Choose Jesus and you do. <laughs> Just contrasting, making a clear line of demarcation. The crucible of the war is within, between flesh and Holy Spirit. For those of us who trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And now Paul shows us that it is the Holy Spirit that is actually the fuel for growing gospel character in our lives, the, the character of Jesus. The fuel for growing gospel character is not, king of the obvious, our flesh. <laughs> It's not our great effort, it's not our works, it's not our religious activity, it is not our moralism that is going to produce the fruit that only comes supernaturally through the Holy Spirit. Like, that just makes sense, right? Hopefully. Notice the personality. So we looked at the personality of the flesh, now look at the personality of the Spirit. He starts here in verse 22. Hopefully this puts a smile on someone's face. Just when you hear these words, as, as opposed to words like factions and envy and strife. He says, first, love. Love. Sacrificially giving to others for their good, not what they can do in return. Love. Joy. Pure delight in God. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Peace. Confident rest in wisdom. and Confident rest in the sovereignty of God. God's in control so I can have peace. It's the peace, Paul says, that passes all understanding. It's not peace because your circumstances all make sense. How could it be when he's talking about suffering? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, facing conflict without blowing up or tapping out. That one kind of hurts. Kindness, practically serving others with no ulterior motive. Goodness, goodness, when you think of good, what's the opposite of good? Like, how do we define good? Good is God's purful, purple, perfection, okay? The center of who God is is He's good. In other words, He's holy. The only way we know what's wrong is by knowing what's right, in other words. So someone who's characterized by goodness is characterized by integrity. Faithfulness, the reliable, right? Gentleness, which is humble or self-forgetful. And self-control, someone who pursues the important over the urgent. Now, this is a singular fruit. These are not the fruits of the Spirit. He says this is the fruit of of the Spirit. And it seems to perfectly describe Jesus, doesn't it? Those aspects, those characteristics. 
And now his life indwells, indwells us through his spirit. And he says, against such things, there is no law. Now, let me just quickly pause and say that this is very different from spiritual gifts. This is very different from temperament. So it's very important to understand that someone could be characterized by, let's say, gentleness. They they're, they're have a gentle kind of temperament. And maybe they're even optimistic. So they tend to be joy-filled kind of person. But they, 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 they hate their neighbor. <laughs> this over here is not the fruit of the Spirit in their life. It's just their temperament. Clearly, it's not the work of the Holy Spirit or they would love their neighbor. Because you can't have one without the other. Someone who's characterized by the fruit of the Spirit is characterized by all of it growing together. When we're characterized by the work of the Holy Spirit, it's not even something that you necessarily learn. It's just, he's, when, uh, I, that's kind of contradicting what I'm about to say. We do, we do learn how to keep in step with the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit comes out all at once. Not all perfectly, not all put together, but as we grow, we, we, we grow a little bit more in, in all of those areas because it's the life of Jesus that's within us. He says, verse 23, the law is not against things such as these. He kind of ends this little section here. The Spirit is actually leading us to fulfill the law. What is the perfect fulfillment of the law? Paul already said it in this passage, in this chapter. He said in verse 14, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping one command, which is, thank you, Debbie. The, what is the core commandment that Jesus wants all of us to fulfill? Love your neighbor. We're really excited about loving our neighbors ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> like this is it. Again, the law is not against such things as Jesus in whom is, he is commanding us to do one thing. <laughs> Love our neighbor as ourselves. That is the fulfillment of the law, right? Now notice how we grow the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Jesus in our lives. He says in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Those who belong. So it's possible to belong somewhere else. But those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So there's, it's possible to belong to someone else other than Jesus. And it's possible as a Christian who belongs to Jesus not to keep in step with the Spirit. That's our struggle. That's the war. So first, three things. Okay, Three, three ways. How to's. How do, we, how do we do this? Number one, remember to whom you belong. I've been practicing this week, guys. This is so simple. Let me tell you exactly how this happened to me several times. I won't get into the details, but I'm tempted to do something, okay, which is sin. Obviously, it's not the Holy Spirit that's leading in me, that's leading that, right? So I'm being tempted to give in to something that in a moment I wanted. Not a bad thing, but I was over wanting something. And I, I won't, it's not appropriate to get into the details of it. But then I came back to this because I've been working on this and I've been thinking about it. And I thought, now, wait a minute. I and I'm praying this even out loud. God, I belong to you. If I belong to you, this doesn't reflect someone who belongs to you. Thank you. In that moment, I had the power. And I just and I and completely walked away from it. I was like, thank you, God. That's awesome. Man, I belong to you. Now, who's getting the credit? God is getting the glory. Because I'm not like, ooh, yeah, I'm so strong. I just overcame. No, I was like, God, thank you. I belong to you. Thank you. I love how Tim Keller summarizes this. I know I'm over quoting Tim Keller, but I promise in the next sermon series I won't. But he's just so influential in this book and in the gospel. He said, quote, our approval and welcome from the Father rests not on our character or actions, but on his. I'm his. And when I remember that I'm his, that's the first step, I think, to walking with the Spirit. Wait, God, I'm yours. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. By God's grace, we are set free. So the second piece of that, not only remember to whom you belong, but remember you belong to Jesus so that you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So in this moment, I'm like, okay, God, I really want this, but... I'm yours, and 
wait a minute. Galatians 2.20, right? I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. God, this isn't what you do. This is, you know, and I, mean, I didn't get all into that, but that was just all the power that I needed in that moment. Wow, thank you, God. Everything was completed on the cross for me. It was crucified, and it's true of every Christian. If you are a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus, you can say, I am crucified with Christ. All those wicked passions that I used to have were nailed to the cross and forgiven. And now I can be set free. It was done. The weight was lifted. Have you ever, maybe in your own testimony, you had all the sin and you're weighed down. And this is, this is my story. Way down. I remember the day, I remember the moment I came to this altar and I gave my life to Jesus. He called me and it was just like, I'm free. I'm free. So now, when I, when I give in to the war, it's just that I'm acting like the old Ed, but I'm the new Ed. The new Ed can walk like the old Ed, but I'm, that's not who I am. I'm the new Ed, though, now. It's true. We, we, we need, though, to experience that truth on a daily basis, which is the way Paul ends this chapter. Aren't you glad? So third and finally, remember to keep in step with the Spirit. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. It's fitting. Since you're in this family, act like it. Choice, you know, in our family, I say this a lot, but man, choice don't do that. <laughs> you know, I try to say that to my kids as often as I can. Wait, no, you're a choice, and we're a Christian family, and that's why we don't, we don't do that. We do things a little bit differently around here. This is the secret sauce of growing the character of Jesus in our lives. Not being a choice, but while keeping in step with the Spirit. <laughs> Now notice that this is a positive process unlike many Christians. You ever met some grouchy Christians? Ugh, like, you're welcome here, but you ain't going to be comfortable here. Ain't no grouchy, this ain't no grouchy group of Christians. We tend to, we, everyone can be a little grouchy sometimes, but Paul didn't give a list of do's and don'ts. The Holy Spirit is a living person, an active member of the Trinitarian Godhead, and we must learn just like a relationship. We must learn to be in relationship with Him. Since you live by the Spirit, so I have this relationship, learn to keep in step with the Spirit. It's a relationship. I have to learn. How do I keep in step with what He is doing within me? He's constantly leading me. He's constantly speaking to me, but I don't always, I don't always listen. Like a husband sometimes doesn't. My wife's talking, she's communicating, she's saying stuff, but I'm not really sure like, that I'm listening. I hear the words, but I'm not really listening. Your wife or husband or a significant other or somebody in your life may have been saying something over and over and you think you get it, but you didn't get it. I'm sure that's it. We can go on and on. We don't have time for all that. But this is, this is what the relationship with the Holy Spirit is like. But I think it's even harder because there's no audible knock. It's not... Your wife or your husband standing in the doorway when you get home. It's a still small voice. Or it's the words that are written here that I, I have to unpack it in order to hear it. It takes time. It's a two-way communicating and listening. And it takes time. And it, and it takes time. <laughs> and this whole thing about walking with God takes time. This whole year, the theme of my year has been slowing down. It's a struggle. Big time. Life around here doesn't go real well with slowing down. Life with four kids and yada, yada, yada. It's probably your story too to some degree. But it takes time. I got to slow down. I got to make time. If I, don't, if I didn't make time for Laura when we first started dating, she would have been asked to go out by some other guy and I would have been too slow. The Spirit is continually leading and guiding us primarily to glorify Jesus in everything we, w that we do. All right, so the YBH. It's vital. we got to make this super practical. Believe it or not, keeping in step with the Spirit doesn't just come naturally because you're a Christian. <laughs> Those of us who are. We don't just get it when we start following Jesus. It's actually a learned relational skill, I believe. Keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, walking with the Holy Spirit, is a learned relational skill. And it involves communicating and listening, just like every relationship. If we were created in the image of God, and this is what all humans are created for, community, 
then we have the example in a human level of what we need in a divine level. We need communication and we need listening. So here are three practices as we wrap up to help us as we grow the fruit of spirit in our lives. Number one, listen to God's word. We say it a lot. Rather than just letting your Bible fall open, okay, today, okay, 2 Samuel 14, God, speak to me. <laughs> I mean, that's better than nothing. But start somewhere that makes sense to where you are. There are lots of great plans. We talk about version a lot. We've been using a great devotional tool in our community groups that's been awesome. Unfortunately, it's only 40 days. So, you know, some of you already ended it. We're, our group's a little, bit, a little bit later since we stretched it out. And so I'm still really enjoying that. But we've got a simple plan that you can follow for the five weeks of Advent, starting in two weeks. So this is, you can jump ahead if you want. If you don't have anything right now, you can go ahead and just start and then just read it twice. But they're, they're, these are on the back. So I just printed this out, Advent reading list. Got a little scripture there for every day, for each day of Advent. So this would be awesome to follow, starting Sunday, my wife's birthday, November 25th. Yeah, in light of uh, Laura's birthday, we're going to start Advent that day. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that nice? You know, that's thoughtful, right? So she's not in here, so she didn't hear that. But um, so Advent list there, and then on the back there's even some weekly devotional, you know, ideas and thoughts right there. So this could help you through Advent and, and really be a way to help you apply the Advent conspiracy. There's lots of other tools, and could just come, come talk to me or uh, one of the pastors, someone you know who reads the Bible regularly, and do it together even. That's even better. Secondly, read prayerfully. So read intentionally. Read prayerfully, slow down, take a, take a quiet minute to take a deep breath. Lord, speak to me. After you're done reading, take a minute and take a deep breath and say, Lord, keep speaking to me. And then read practically. And I, that, we're already out of time, but I loved in, in the materials that we've been going through, 40 Days in the Word, I loved the Space Pets uh, 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 acronym. And so if Space Pets, no, no, that helps me. Don't, you don't, no, don't judge me. <laughs> I love that because it's always asking how what you're reading applies to your life. And so Space Pets is sin to confess, promise to claim, attitude to change, command to obey, example to follow, prayer to prayer, uh, error to avoid, truth to believe, something praise God. I know that's long. It's kind of a long list. But I like going through that as I'm reading scripture and I can ask, man, is there something in this? That is in one of these categories that, that God's speaking to me about. Sometimes I just need that. Debbie does not need that. I can't remember. <laughs> no, I can't remember it either. But I love the fact that it was like written on every page during that week. And so that's helped me. I really like that. Second, so don't just read the Bible, but confess sin. The more time we spend listening to God's word, the more sensitive we will be to our own sin. And recognize the spirit leading us to confession. Specifically when our hearts make things or experiences idols, which is where what our hearts are good at doing. And then finally, listen to God's people. We were created for community, authentic, loving community, which uh, most of you have said, that's why you like being here at Restoration Church, because we were, you were accepted, you're part of a family, uh, you, you, you were impacted by the community here, where we share our joy and pain, and we practice sharing, we practice listening, we share and listen to God, and we, let, we share and listen to others as God speaks to us through that, right? So listen to God's word, confess sin, listen to God's people, three really practical ways that we can grow in keeping in step with the Spirit. May God help us this week to unleash us. Let's close in prayer. We're going to sing a song and uh, join in what God is saying to us. We've heard God's word here this morning.